Hello, I'm Dr. Paul Anthony White and this is the first video in my Introduction to International Relations series. So what I would like to do in this video is just give you a general overview of IR both as an academic discipline and as a practical phenomenon. So let's begin with the very obvious question, what is international relations? And there are two answers to that question. First of all, international relations is a phenomenon, i.e. the real world practice of international relations, of global politics. But the term international relations also refers to the academic discipline, to the academic field. Um, which is focused on the study of the phenomenon of international relations. And when we are talking about IR as an academic discipline, it's normal to capitalise. We normally use capitals um, to refer to the, the name of the discipline. The term international relations implies relations between nations, relations between nation states, um, or relations between, to use a colloquial term, relations between countries. The terms country and state are not quite synonymous, by the way, and we'll talk more about that in the second video. Um, but traditionally, IR has been about the study of relationships between countries in inverted commas relationships between governments relationships between states and that includes everything from formal diplomatic relations to matters of war and peace matters of international trade and so on and this remains very important um, states remain key actors on the world stage and a great deal of what we study in international relations is the relationships between states relationships between governments but it's not the whole of the picture and particularly in a, an age of globalization we increasingly recognize that other types of actors have an influence on the world stage as well so for example transnational corporations large um, international corporations um, which can be of course very wealthy very influential are significant actors um, we have other kinds of actors, NGOs, non-governmental organisations, um, through to, of course, quite sinister organisations, groups like terror groups and, and international organised crime groups and so on. Um, so there are a, a, quite a, a wide range of different types of actor on the world stage. And these other types of actor are important as well. Um, so a key concern of, of IR in the present day is the study of globalization. So as international relations scholars, um, one of the key things that we are trying to do is find patterns and recurring themes in this hugely complex system, which is global politics. Um, so ultimately, um, at first glance the world system may appear rather chaotic we have all of these actors we have nation states we have other types of actors um, we have these very complex interactions um, going on and it can all seem quite chaotic but ultimately our role as scholars as, as i r scholars is to try to make sense of this and one of the starting points for, for making sense of the world system is to try and identify if you like what are the rules of the game um, what are the key recurring patterns the key re recurring themes that we can identify and once we have identified these then we can use those as the basis of creating international relations theory now i don't want to talk much about theory at the moment because we'll get onto that later on but suffice to say that IR theory ultimately is the basis for our understanding of the world system. And the starting point for creating theory, once again, is to look for these recurring patterns um, within the world system. Now, 
Now, IR is a very broad discipline and um, different scholars working under this broad umbrella term IR um, are going to be interested in, in different types of issues. Um, and within IR, there are various subfields, um, various different branches of IR. So some IR scholars, for example, are going to be interested in international political economy. Um, some IR scholars are going to be interested in areas such as international development. Um, some IR scholars, for example, are going to be interested in matters of war and peace. Um, war and peace is a, a huge um, aspect of, of international relations um, right from the beginning of the discipline. One of the key fundamental questions that IR scholars have been interested in um, is how do we deal with matters of war and peace? How do we um, seek to prevent war and work towards a more peaceful world. And again, right from the beginning of IR as a discipline, um, IR really emerged about just over 100 years ago at the end of the First World War. And the primary focus at that time was on um, questions of how can we prevent this from occurring again? Um, looking at this terrible war which had just occurred and the horrors of that war and the mass casualties which had occurred, there was a huge focus on how can we um, prevent wars like this from occurring in the future. And um, 100 years on, although IR has kind of expanded to become this very, very broad discipline, nonetheless, one of the central questions, one of the key most important questions that we, we remain concerned with is this issue of how do we work towards building a more peaceful world? And this is one aspect of um, the creation of order in the international system. So again, the international system at first glance can appear to be very chaotic. Um, there is no world government. We've got a bunch of nation states, which at least in theory are sovereign and do their own thing. We have other types of actors, which again are focused on their own concerns. Um, and it can appear to be quite chaotic. It, it can appear that there is no one in charge. And indeed, in one sense, there isn't. There is no world government. But nonetheless, um, it's not total anarchy. It's not total chaos. Um, we do have a level of order at the global level. For the most part, um, things work. So you can get on a plane in one country and you can fly across a dozen other countries and land at your destination and be reasonably sure, for example, that you're not going to get shot down and that you're going to be able to travel safely through the airspace of a dozen different countries. Why? Because there are international agreements and there is a system in place to allow that to happen. So international travel works, international trade works, for example, international communications work. I mean, I'm recording this video in in the UK but many of you will be watching it in other parts of the world. Why? Because the internet works. Um, so these are just a few examples of how there is order, there is organisation in um, the global system. And again we as IR scholars are interested in how does that order arise. So we are interested in institutions and organisations like, for example, the United Nations, but a myriad of others as well. Uh, We're interested in how those organisations come about and the extent to which that they um, they function effectively, the extent, the extent to which they are able to produce and provide stability and order in the world system. But a lot of this ultimately comes down also to questions of power. Um, who holds the power in the international system? And what types of actors hold the power? And what do we mean by power at all? Um, again, these are some of the core questions that we're focused on. We use the term power a lot, um, but we need to think about what power might mean. And again, there isn't necessarily one single definition either of what power is. Um, so that's another key question that we will explore, the, the definition of the, and the nature of power and questions around who holds the power in international relations. 
So issues of war and peace, obviously very important to IR and a lot of IR scholars specialise in that area. Um, we have um, fields of study such as security studies and peace studies, which um, in some respects are kind of seen as disciplines in their own right, but they are also kind of sub-disciplines of the broader field that is international relations. Um, so war and peace obviously very important, um, but many other um, issues which are of key concern as well and of course another obvious one is international economics um, international trade international political economy um, to some extent i mean that's traditionally been seen in terms of um, trade relations between countries and again that's still kind of an important aspect of the world system but in some respects again in a globalized world it makes sense also to see the whole world as a single global economy rather than a, a set of um, a set of national economies um, so again we've, we've already talked a little bit about global governance how do we manage this how do we regulate um, international trade international communications international travel what kind of systems are created to, to manage um, to manage these areas and who are the actors involved in that and once again it's not just about nation states um, it's not just about governments very often governments through intergovernmental organizations like the UN and the UN agencies put the basic um, framework in place um, and other actors operate within that framework but in other instances you have private actors creating their own systems of governance non-governmental actors creating their own what we call international regimes um, in in specific areas of international commerce in specific areas of international trade in specific areas of international communications in, in some cases we have um, private companies and private non-state actors um, taking a leading role in creating non-state forms of governance as well and so we as IR scholars are also very interested in these phenomena not just in interstate um, governance systems but also private and public private um, systems of governance as well then we have issue areas like human rights and to some extent linked to this issues around global poverty global inequalities and global development um, again lots of questions around exactly what do human rights mean and is there a right for example to economic development is there a right to um, a certain minimum standard of, of living and if so whose responsibility is it to ensure that that right is um, fulfilled um, how do we go about dealing with global uh, poverty which is still a huge problem and I mean by poverty I, I don't just mean not being able to afford a new car or a new TV I mean not having enough to eat there are five million children starved to death every year in the world that's just the children that's that's not even the adults we're talking five million kids um, die every year because of lack of um, adequate nutrition now that's pretty staggering that's a pretty staggering figure in in the 21st century so what do we do about that you know whose responsibility is it and um, what do we do in practical terms to, to, to tackle that so issues around poverty and inequality are of course a, a massive concern within IR um, another massive concern of course being the environment um, climate change is is real um, the question is what do we do about it and, and what in practical terms can we do because again climate change is a good example of a, a global issue it's not something that any one state any one country or any one government can tackle on its own it requires global coordination so how do we go about achieving that in practical terms so again, these are just some of the, the key um, issue areas, what we call issue areas that international relations scholars are interested in.
so who are the key actors in international relations? Uh, well, as I've already mentioned, there are you know a wide range of different kinds of actors which play a role in um, the international decision making process in global politics uh, in global governance. So um, we've talked a little bit about intergovernmental organisations, um, so organisations like the United Nations and its um, the the the, um, the the range of different um, intergovernmental bodies which sit within the UN system, such as the um, the UN specialised agencies. We've talked about non-governmental organisations, um, which again there are a huge huge range of different organizations which could be um, described as NGOs you know everything from you know something like Amnesty International to Greenpeace, um, Doctors Without Borders, uh, Oxfam, uh, Save the Children there, there are thousands thousands and thousands of NGOs dealing with a vast range of issues and, and issue areas the one thing that they all have in common is, first of all, that they operate at the global level. Um, and secondly, that they are not organised by governments, you know, non-governmental organisations. They are organised, um, they, they may interact with governments, um, but they are not organised by governments. They're separate from government, from governments in, and from states in their organisation. Multinational corporations, of course, we've already mentioned, and again, um, potentially wielding huge amounts of power because some of the largest corporations um, they control, of course, huge amounts of wealth. Um, they, in many cases, they are richer than a lot of countries. You know, they operate across international borders, and they potentially have huge levels of economic clout. Um, we've talked about some of the more sinister organisations, illicit organisations like criminal organisations and terror groups. We can also talk about the role of individuals because sometimes, you know, particular individuals can have a, a significant impact on the world stage in their own right. Um, so, for example, we might talk about a good sort of recent example would be Greta Thunberg, the uh, environmental activist. Um, who you know is someone who we can say has you know created a created a stir in international politics in her own right, or we might be talking about someone like the the Dalai Lama um, or the Pope, you know, or someone like Karl Marx, for example. So all of these different types of actor are significant on the world stage. However, traditionally, IR was about states and the government, uh, the governments of states. And um, states remain some of the key actors, arguably, arguably still the most important actors on the international stage. Um, and that is a result of the fact that states alone possess sovereignty. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about sovereignty a little bit further on. Um, but the possession of sovereignty is the thing that kind of sets states apart from other kinds of actors and arguably um, cements their position as the key actors on the world stage. So that's IR as a real world phenomenon. Um, but let's consider now international relations as an academic discipline. By academic discipline, I mean a field of study at university level. And IR um, is sometimes seen as an offshoot of, of political science, as kind of a branch of political science, and more broadly as a branch of the social sciences. And to some extent it is, but not entirely. 
um, because international relations is what we call interdisciplinary, i.e. It, it overlaps with many other fields of study. Um, some of the obvious ones being, for example, economics or geography or political science, but also history. Um, there's a lot of history in IR. And indeed, the first IR scholars were indeed historians. Um, you cannot understand the the present, the, the, the present day international world without understanding the past, without understanding how this world came to be. So there's a huge amount of history in international relations. Um, so again, it's only been about 100 years um, since IR became recognised as an academic discipline in its own right, but of course it has much deeper intellectual roots in these other fields of study um, with which IR still shares a lot of um, a lot of overlap, a lot of common ground. Since IR first appeared as an academic discipline, again just over a hundred years ago, uh, it has evolved a great deal. There have been a, a lot of developments in the field. Um, and in particular, in terms of the theoretical frameworks that underpin our understanding of the world. Now, again, as I previously mentioned, I don't want to talk a lot about IR theory just yet because we'll come on to that um, later. But suffice to say that there is no one single theory of IR. Um, different IR scholars have different perspectives on the world different ways of understanding the world and different assumptions about what is important, what are the key things that we should focus on when we are studying the world. So for example, are we should you know should we be most concerned with the interactions of nation states? Is that the most important thing that we should concern ourselves with? Some IR scholars would say very much so, others would disagree. Or is it more important that we focus on perhaps economics and inequalities and the rule of not so much states, but ruling elites, the power of ruling elites? Again, some IR scholars would, would argue that that is very much the case. Some IR scholars would say that we need to concentrate mainly on material things, so things like um, economic output or military capability, how many tanks have you got, how many nuclear weapons have you got, um, and, and so on. You know, many scholars would say that these material things are the most important aspects of world politics that we need to focus on. Other scholars would say that the role of ideas and ideologies is more important and that to really understand world politics we need to be looking at the role of ideas. Um, some scholars would say for example that the aftermath of colonialism is the lens through which we need to view the world. Um, feminist IR scholars would say that gender is a very important issue in, inter in international politics that we need to focus on. So again, different IR scholars coming from different perspectives are going to focus on different things. And as a result, they create different sets of theories, different sets of theoretical concepts um, to make sense of the world that we see around us. Um, and the development of IR theory, the development of this kind of grand conversation within the discipline of IR, this, this grand discourse and, and set of debates between competing theories, this is the story of IR as a discipline and the story of how it has evolved over time. But again, I'm not going to go into any depth about that just now. Um, it's, it's very complicated, of course, and we'll cover that in a lot more detail as, as we go along in future videos. So going right back to the beginning of IR as an academic discipline, um, it is usually traced to the creation of the very first chair of international politics, um, the very first um, department effectively um, under a professor of international politics anywhere in the world and that chair was created at the University of Aberystwyth in 1919 um, and again it was um, this, this development was prompted by the First World War 
and the um, the huge interest at that time in um, finding ways to reorganize the international system in order to prevent further conflict. Um, the First World War was a, a huge shock um, to kind of the psyche of uh, not just this country but all of the nations involved. Um, it obviously was a, a huge bloodbath. Um, we're talking about industrialized warfare on um, a scale never before seen. We're talking about you know mass carnage, of course, um, the horrors of the war, and there was very much a sense in uh, immediately after the war in 1919 and and the, the following years that this must never happen again. You know that this must be the war to end all wars. So there was a, a huge amount of interest in, in, in a practical sense, you know, we saw the creation of the, the League of Nations um, with the, the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, one component of that was the creation of the League of Nations as a mechanism to um, facilitate future um, multilateral efforts to resolve conflict and resolve dispute um resolve disputes without resorting to war so these uh, developments um in in practice of ir um these kind of real world developments were reflected um in academia as well and um this this newly found interest in international organization in, in multilateralism um, in finding ways to um, peacefully resolve disputes between nations and reduce the likelihood of future war um, this was the context to the emergence of IR as a formal international a, a, a formal academic discipline and here is the first, effectively, the first professor of international relations, uh, Alfred Eckhard Zimmern, who was appointed Woodrow Wilson Chair of International Politics at the University of Aberystwyth in 1919. So again, um, effectively the world's first professor heading up the world's first department of international relations. Since that time, of course, um, IR has um, expanded hugely as a discipline and has become a, a highly popular subject uh, offered at probably the, the majority of universities across the globe, um, certainly universities of any um, substantial size. Um, but again, the discipline has continued to evolve as global politics itself has evolved over the last century. Um, so IR has found itself confronted with a changing um, geopolitical picture and has had to try to find ways to explain that. So, for example, uh, in the, the early years, again, there was kind of a lot of optimism around the League of Nations and the, uh, the idea of, of multilateralism and collective security and the idea that, you know, uh, war could be prevented through the League of Nations. Um, but that then kind of in the 30s gave way, of course, to the... Um, to the rise of the fascist dictatorships, um, the rise of, of Hitler, um, the rise of Mussolini, which had occurred a few years earlier, of course, um, the, um, the the activities of, of Imperial Japan um, in invading um, Manchuria um, and the um, the Spanish Civil War and ultimately you know in Europe the um, the the Nazi um, invasions of um, the, the Anschluss of Austria the invasion of Czechoslovakia ultimately the invasion of Poland ultimately the outbreak of the Second World War proper uh, and then of course you know the, the US being brought into that as well with Pearl Harbor in 1941 um, so basically what had been initially had been a, a very optimistic picture or it seemed a very sort of promising and hopeful picture at the beginning of the 1920s 
by the time we get to the late 1930s, the picture looks a lot more bleak, uh, a lot more grim. Um, nonetheless, 1945 was again a renewed interest in saying, OK, we need to you know, try again, basically, um, to try to um, figure out what went wrong. Why did the League of Nations fail? Why was war not prevented? You know, is it is it um, possible to um, to rectify those mistakes um, and create a more robust system through the United Nations, um, which hopefully will be more successful this time around? But then, of course, as the Second World War ended, the Cold War was really beginning, um, and we have the Cold War standoff, which lasted uh, almost fifty years. Um, and of course, the the nuclear arms race, which um, took place in the context of that, um, the prospect of mutually assured destruction, the prospect for the first time of, of a conflict and the use of weapons, which potentially could annihilate human civilization itself. Um, the Cold War ultimately came to an end, of course. So. Um, in the kind of the mid-century period, IR was concerned with with analysing the Cold War. Um, in the 1990s, IR became concerned with explaining, okay, why did the Cold War end? Um, what happened? Why did the Cold War come to an end? Why did the Soviet Union collapse? Um, emerging issues, of course, around increasingly um, increasing intensification of globalisation. Um, we had phenomena as well kind of linked to globalization, um, such as um, regional integration, the emergence of the European community and its evolution into the European Union. Um, and of course, the emergence of, of regional integration in, in other parts of the, the world as well. Um, again, um, you know, a kind of a new phenomenon, the emergence of, of supranationalism, um, as well as the intensification of, you know, um, of the requirement for, for governance mechanisms at the global level, as well as the, uh, the regional level. Um, then, of course, you know, even more recently, we've had the emergence of um, the global war on terror uh, and all of the issues related to that. You know, these are just a few examples of some of the kind of defining issues um, which have caused IR itself to evolve, to try to deal with and try to explain that sort of changing geopolitical landscape over the last 100 years. So all of these new patterns and trends emerging. Um, so we've talked about globalization. Um, we talked about supranationalism, um, regional and even global integration. Um, but again, we, we, we see conflicting patterns as well. You know, it's not all, if the picture is not straightforward, you know, some of these patterns and trends even appear contradictory. So yes, on the one hand, we do have supranationalism. We do have um integration regional integration through organizations like the eu like mercosur um in south america or the african union for example so on the one hand we have this this pattern of greater integration and uh and supranationalism supranational governance and yet simultaneously at the same time we have also witnessed a resurgence of nationalism we have seen the fragmentation of states um, into um, sort of national, you know, along along national lines. Um, so, for example, the the USSR um, broke up into its component states. Yugoslavia, of course, um, fragmented um, into a, um, a a patchwork of um, uh, a patchwork of smaller states. Um, with a you know um, a lot of um, conflict and bloodshed involved in that as well. Um, in other cases, you had, for example, Czechoslovakia breaking up into Slovakia and the Czech Republic, which was a, um, achieved peacefully in that case. Um, we've seen Sudan separate into um, 
Sudan and, and South Sudan, um, again in the context of a quite a, a bloody civil war. Um, so again, kind of a contradictory pattern. On the one hand, the world seems to be coming together um, and the creation of new sort of structures beyond the nation state and, and increasing integration. And yet on the other hand, we're seeing increasing, in some cases, fragmentation as well. So the world seems to be kind of coming together and breaking apart at the same time. So how do we make sense of that? Um, and that is, you know, this is the kind of question that IR seeks to answer, seeks to explain. IR seeks to, first of all, identify these patterns. What are the key patterns in global politics? And then to try to find ways to explain these patterns. And this is the role of international relations theory to offer a framework for explanation. So to summarize, IR is hugely complex, um, both the real world phenomenon of IR and the academic discipline which studies it, um, both are hugely complex and it takes quite a while to get your head around the subject. And that's quite normal. If, if you are new to the study of IR, and you're feeling a little bit at sea and a little bit confused and you're struggling to get your head around um, what IR is and what this is all about, you are not alone because I can, I can still remember um, when I was a, a first year undergraduate student um, really struggling to get my head around the discipline and what IR was. Um, it's been over a quarter of a century since I first started to study IR, but I can still remember how confusing it was um, to begin with. So if that's um, if that's you, don't worry. It's it's quite normal to feel um, to feel confused and perhaps a bit overwhelmed at first when you first start to study the discipline because it is hugely complex. As we've said, um, the discipline has existed as a field of study in its own right for only around a century or so, but has very significant overlap with uh, older fields of study, uh, such as in particular history, um, economics, geography, political science and others. And as we've said, our role as IR scholars, what we are seeking to do ultimately is to make sense of a very complex and a very chaotic world. And IR scholars do this by trying to identify, okay, who are the key actors? What are the key issues? What are the underlying patterns in world politics? What are the key power relationships? However, um, as we've said, not all uh, IR scholars will agree on the answers to those questions and different groups of scholars will in fact focus on different aspects of world politics. This has given rise to a number of different theoretical paradigms on IR which have emerged as the discipline itself has evolved and again um, in future videos we'll start to explore in more detail what these different theoretical perspectives are and what scholars coming from these perspectives have to say about the world. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an overview of IR, um, both as a practical phenomenon and as an academic discipline. If you found this video useful, then please like, and um, if you'd like to stay up to date on my future content, then please subscribe also. And once again, if you have any comments, then please feel free to post those in the comments section below. Um, again, it would be useful to get um, a discussion going. Um, so I, I welcome any comments that anyone would like to post. Thanks very much for viewing and I'll see you on the next video.